Uh, my name is Martha Cavallo, and I'm the main representative to UN ECOSOG for the World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations. Um, we welcome you to our parallel event this morning, which we have entitled Women Journalists as Human Rights Defenders in Ukraine. Uh, from the very top, I just want to make a note, as you can see, that we do have video going and we will have a photographer. If you really uh, do not want to be on any images, then uh, if you could uh, just take that into account. Um, go to the back of the room uh, is, is one option. But otherwise, um, just, so, just so in case you miss the signals, that's, that's what we have here. Um, we, I want to thank our co-sponsors from the very top also. Um, the International Council of Women. Uh, we uh, have Irena Kurovitska here who, rep who represents the International Council of Women at the United Nations. The National Council of Women of Ukraine, Dr. Ludmila Poroknyakhanovska is here in support. Um, we uh, thank also the Ukrainian National Women's League of America for being here, the president is here. And I'd like to introduce to you our uh, Women's Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations president, Oresa Sushko, who is sitting here in the front row. So thank, you. thank you all for your support, each and every one of you. Um, I, uh, our panelists you will be introduced to in turn as they come up. I want to thank my colleague at the UN, Irene Jarosevich, uh, who is our main representative to UNDPI for being the monitor today. She's an uh, editor, journalist, writer, researcher. Thank you, Irena, for, for taking on. And it is our honor to be expecting Isla Bakali today, who is the uh, United States representative of the Crimean Tatar Majlis, the parliament of the Crimean uh, community in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. Um, and she will be introducing the latter segment of our presentation today. Uh, today is an important day. It is a, it's a sad um, day. March 16, 2014, four years ago, is the day of the controversial, refuted referendum on the status of Crimea. It remains unrecognized by the world in the United Nations. The citizens of Russian-occupied Crimea on that day and in the city of Sevastopol were asked to come out and to vote on their opinion as to whether they, oh, as to what their future was to be. <laughs> With not all of the votes counted, half of the votes counted, uh, it was claimed that 95.5% of the population had, jo had uh, voted to join the Russian Federation. Uh, these unrecognized actions uh, leading to the takeover of Crimea were violations of all levels of international law. The violation then, violations then continued with aggression against Ukraine's eastern oblast, uh, territories of Luhansk and Donetsk oblast, the area that we call the Donbass. This resulted in 1.6 million people now uh, in the status of internally displaced persons, tremendous human suffering, and over 10,000 victims, uh, casualties, deaths, and untold numbers of people injured. The human rights abuses in this context abound. 2018 is also uh, a, another anniversary. It's the 20th anniversary of the passage at the United Nations of the Declaration uh, on Human Rights Defenders. The Declaration recognizes their special uh, status within their communities and their right to have all of their actions their opportunities, their possibilities uh, supported and secure. Uh, the declaration recognizes that there are some professions within uh, each society that uh, whose job directly relates to the protection of human rights, such as uh, law enforcement people, policemen, also judges working in the court systems. So such professions are immediately 
uh, connected to human rights defense. But there, uh, in the Declaration, it also mentions strongly that all of us, regardless of who we are, when we see human rights by being violated, each of us has a responsibility to respond to that and to let it be known. Uh, journalists are particularly in a position of opportunity to observe these things and to report on these things. And we find that their position is often one of, of uh, danger or um, they are often, uh, their lives are complicated because of this responsibility that they feel. In Ukraine, um, in the post-Soviet period, so many women uh, rushed into the field of journalism and they were all very interested in social justice issues. Of course, with the beginning of the conflict, this is also their focus, what they want to report on. So today, we welcome today's panel because it'll be um, not all professional journalists, but people close to that, and women, and how they felt their positions were affected by what they saw, what they felt responsible to do, and um, how they were able to maneuver around that. So. I thank you very much for joining the panel, and please enjoy. Good morning, thank you. Um, I am Irene Jerozovich, I am the moderator. Uh, right now what we're going to do is sit away from the screen, so we're not in order of these name tags necessarily, so please bear with us. Again, I welcome everybody. Um, I did want to underscore exactly what Martha said. Two, two dates. One, the reason that today is important is for two reasons. One, because of the referendum, which has been universally recognized as illegal in Crimea. And the second one is because it is the 20th anniversary of the uh, UN Declaration for Human Rights Defenders. In the post-war period, which those of us who are older and remember and grew up, the reason these treaties and laws and agreements made a difference and it were important is because the younger generations don't remember the brutality of World War II in Europe. And we all agreed afterwards to set up these agreements, everybody compromised, nationally, internationally, in order to stop abuse and bloodshed. Unfortunately, the violations that have been happening in the last decade, in particular, on the territory of Eastern Europe have been egregious. And the UN, everybody from the UN Security Council to European governments have fought against them and protested them. We've invited and we're really encouraged that young journalists are with us because they actually see the violations firsthand, but also because they're carrying on that tradition and knowledge that you need to, in order to follow the rules, you need to report when the rules are broken. So we look forward to hearing from all of them about how information uh, or lies and disinformation uh, actually endanger lives. We are interested in hearing uh, their observations from the front line. Um, Isla will be coming, I don't see her yet, from the Crimean Tartars. She will be explaining how difficult it is for Crimean Tartar journalists to actually work and cover um, their uh, work. So let us begin right away with Professor Tamara. And I'm not going to do the bios. Uh, hopefully everybody has one, so I'm not going to read them. If you don't, they're up front. And that way, we're just not going to waste time with the bios. Tamara? promoting gender equality and I'll, uh, I would like to start that recent events in Ukraine connected with the Euromaidan protest of 2013-14 and later armed conflict in the eastern part brought changes into women's lives and their roles both in the society and their families. Uh, from one hand, the threat of uh, violence makes women more vulnerable towards social economic situation. Uh, women are the majority among internally displaced persons uh, 
from Eastern Ukraine responsible for children, elderly and disabled relatives. From the other hand, uh, during these turbulent events, Ukrainian women managed to challenge traditional gender roles as uh, mainly cares and victims of conflict and reclaimed visibility, recognition and respect as volunteers and fighters for human rights. A number of women combined two professions or tasks, a human uh, rights activism and journalism. That is rather challenging and demanding a lot of efforts. They are those who work with different issues among which are gender equality and prevention of gender-based violence. Uh, working as a gender expert of Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union, in 2016 I launched uh, the special project on women's visibility called uh, Women Human Rights Defenders Who Change Ukraine. It includes a series of interviews, currently there are 32, with uh, female human rights activists from all over Ukraine working in different spheres of human rights protection and representing uh, various organizations including uh, Ukrainian uh, Helsinki Human Rights Union. Among hearings are those who are both uh, human rights activists and journalists, for example, Olha Vesnyanka, Tatyana Pachonchik, Maria Tomak and others. What is the major role of female human rights activists and journalists? Uh, first of all, they are those who pay attention to women's rights issue in Ukraine. Uh, problems of uh, sexism and gender-based violence. For example, they launch campaigns to raise awareness on gender equality issues in society. One of these campaigns is uh, Povaha, Campania Proto Sexism, Respect, Campaign Against Sexism in uh, Politics and Media. Irina Vertos, Olya Vesnyanka, Larissa Donusenko, and others write critical materials on sexist commands from Ukrainian politicians and other public figures. They remind Ukrainian authority on international obligations towards gender equality implementation issues. Uh, one of the major problems in Ukraine, as far as in the world in general, is connected with prevention of gender-based violence. Activists and journalists are struggling to ratify the Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combating uh, violence against women and domestic violence, or so-called Istanbul Convention. That is the first legally binding instrument in Europe on this subject and the most far-reaching international treaty in this field. Ukraine signed the Istanbul Convention in 2011 but fails to ratify it due to the fears of word gender from some of Ukrainian deputies and church officials. One of the stereotypical perception of women uh, in Ukraine is connected with beautiful objects to inspire men. For example, unfortunately, even Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko this year, in his Facebook greetings of women with International Women's Day that is still celebrated in uh, post-Soviet countries and in Ukraine, says, a woman is a symbol of all the best in our lives, kindness and love, joy and warmth, Thanks to such women who are in Ukraine and for their sake we certainly will receive victory over the enemy. And one of the major slogans uh, of these greetings was beauty will save the world. <laughs> so in this, uh, in this situation female human <coughs> rights activists they not only fight like uh, different problems, but they need to fight sexism and perception of them as beautiful objects, first of all. And they, for, they organize professional association. For example, last year, <coughs> Ukrainian F uh, Women Lawyers Association, UFM, was created, and they pay attention to such ob object objectification of professional women. For example, they criticize beauty contest for female lawyers. Uh, 
that is organized also uh, <coughs> supported by association of lawyers or advocates of Ukraine in uh, in this year and finally uh, activists and journalists raise awareness on sexual violence as a rather silent issue in Ukraine in summer 2016 activist uh, Nastya Melnichenko started online campaign Yane Boyus Kazate I am not afraid to say it's similar to me too here in uh, US uh, in Facebook Nasty wrote posts where referred to women to share their stories of sexual violence. Uh, during first five months, around 4,000 uh, 4, posts appeared in Facebook. Among them, majority of those that break silence about the topic of gender-based and sexual violence, and also prominent uh, ju female journalists and human rights activists, they joined this uh, uh, this campaign of flash mob. And to conclude, I really hope that the role of female <coughs> activists and journalists in Ukraine will be recognized and valued. Thank you. You know, just go ahead and leave that up there. And I think my voice is probably loud enough, so I don't need the microphone. Um, OK. Uh, next will be, um, oops, sorry, get in there? No? Lisa, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Lisa. All right. Please. Well, that's it. Oh, it's fine. Who comes from? Yeah. No, you don't have to hold it. <laughs> no, we're, we're going to just come up there. It's easy instead of handing it around. No, it is. My name is Alisa Sotova. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. You yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. Better. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to talk about the female journalists working in the front line of the bar. Um, I just a couple of weeks ago I came back from from Ukraine and uh, I've been talking to people in the Ukrainian uh, Union of Journalists. And we've been discussing that uh, actually we don't have statistics yet, but there are m it, it looks like there are more women covering uh, the conflict in Eastern Ukraine than there are men. Uh, since the very beginning, women were very actively involved in covering the conflict. And uh, I would argue that it is not, uh, it's not a random situation. It's not an accident. <coughs> uh, I would say that in the, in the beginning, in 2014, it was uh, a sort of a survival and professional strategy. Because if you were a, a woman, we can argue it was uh, this were gender-based stereotypes and everything. But uh, if you were a woman, you had less chance to be arrested, to be randomly arrested, to be beaten up. You had more chances to get out safely from where you were. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of women uh, working there. And uh, uh, now, after four years, uh, I think we can observe some first trends and differences between male-style coverage of the conflict and female-style coverage of the conflict. Uh, I've been just recently working with my, with my male colleague, a photographer, and uh, um, we had a problem, we had a small conflict every day. Uh, because uh, basically every day when you're working in the war zone, you have a choice of either going to the um, frontline positions and hanging out with soldiers, or going to the nearby villages and hanging out with civilians. And uh, I always wanted to go hang out with civilians, while my colleague always wanted to go hang out with soldiers. And I think this is sort of a trend that women tend to pay more attention at uh, civilian problems um, and the way how war distorts uh, uh, everyday life of people rather than the, uh, who shot what from where, where it fell down and how, how it all went. 
This is um, my colleague Anastasia Magazova, who works for Deutsche Welle uh, in Ukraine. This is an example of her covering uh, uh, the lives of um, uh, Roma population in uh, the war zone. Um, and um, then, um, especially, I think, when, it's, when it comes to, when it happens in your country and you take it very personally, um, and you cover the social issues, uh, it's hard to stay within the frame of journalism and just to report on what's happening. Uh, and th then often female journalists uh, engage in uh, um, some other projects in which they try to um, um, to, trans to transmit rather um, not only informational but also emotional side of what's happening, try to show people, to make people feel what's happening there. Uh, one of the first attempts uh, to do this was made by my colleague um, uh, Katerina Pieszka uh, from Gorlovka. She uh, used to live in Kyiv for a long time when uh, the war started. Uh, but um, she launched in uh, summer 2014, she launched uh, um, a hashtag uh, project called uh, Mood and Bus, in which she, uh, she offered people to share stories, to, uh, to express the idea that it's not only the war zone, but this is only this also a place that associates for many people with their childhood, with their uh, memories. And um, she offered people to share uh, their opportunities, uh, their um, uh, memories. Unfortunately, it didn't go very far, but it was a good attempt. Um, this, uh, our colleague Anastasia Magazova, she um, did a very interesting thing of bringing uh, um, a violent player from Germany, um, um, Marina Bondas, to Avdeevka in uh, winter 2016, when Avdeevka was without heating and uh, in a very hard humanitarian situation. So this um, violent player, she, uh, she brought her to the um, uh, apartment building, which is just on the edge of the town, just by the front lines. You can see behind her back this, um, the signs of destruction. And she was playing violin facing towards the front line and towards Donetsk. Um, this is uh, Anastasia Pugach, um, a journalist from Donetsk. She used to work uh, in the um, uh, uh, Donbass TV channel. She moved to Kiev and became one of the co-founders of the Theater of Displaced People, which, one, which, which is now one of the main psychodrama projects that helps, uh, uh, that helps uh, not only IDPs, but all the people who have a war trauma uh, deal with, uh, their, the, the, with their trauma. Um, this is Svetlana Gajanyan, a uh, former uh, uh, chief of uh, a press club of Donetsk. Uh, when the war started, she moved to um, um, a village near the town of Drushkovka in the Donetsk region. And she found out that everything was in a bad state there. The school in which she studied was, uh, was in a bad state. Uh, the um, uh, hospitals lacked uh, uh, medical equipment. Uh, there was no playground for children. And she started uh, um, acting as an activist, uh, uh, applying for grants and trying. She repaired the school. She, she has a specific um, a female project uh, called Dorovu Zhinko v Drushkivko, a healthy woman to Drushkovka, um, as part of which she bought this medical equipment for, uh, for the local hospital. Um, this is an example of uh, the uh, project that um, uh, me and my colleague Anastasia Taylor Lind we launched together. Uh, it's called uh, Welcome to Donetsk, and it we, <coughs> um, we bought uh, 2,000 postcards uh, which were printed for uh, a football championship of Euro 2012 in Donetsk which have uh, this nice um, uh, nice scenes of the Nietzsche on one side and on the other side we write uh, the names of uh, people who were killed in the conflict, both civilians and uh, uh, combatants on both sides, uh, from both sides. Um, uh, in order to do this we had to make our own research gathering uh, from open sources uh, and put in, in the stables uh, uh, the names of the people killed. And uh, we've been sending it all over the world and you can see that uh, for many people it became uh, um, a reason to think a bit more about the conflict. Like you can see in the bottom right corner that somebody received the postcard and Googled the person on the other side of the, po <coughs> on the postcard and found out the story of the death of this uh, boy who, was, who, who died during Shelling and Daniel. Other people try to commemorate these victims by lighting candles or doing <coughs> other kinds of things like this. Uh, obviously, uh, these were a few examples. There are more others. But uh, obviously the uh, Ukrainian society is uh, so traumatized right now and the political situation is so poisonous that trying to speak up for human rights or for anything and trying to 
radio voice usually results in a lot of uh, public harassment. Um, <clears throat> uh, a survey made by a uh, Ukrainian NGO called the uh, Institute, of, Institute of Mass Information just a couple of weeks ago um, showed that uh, uh, female journalists in Ukraine often uh, face uh, threats, uh, internet trolling, and uh, bot attacks uh, as a result of their activities. And uh, I would also argue that uh, um, a lot of these uh, threats are not uh, purely gender determined. Um, this is um, an example of a message that I received uh, very recently uh, after I tried to advocate for people who live in the gray zones close to the front lines uh, in the uh, villages like Pieski or Opetne where um, government uh, pretends that they don't live there and uh, refuses to give them any support. So somebody wrote to me that uh, I and the other people from Donetsk should be hanged. So this is not gender determined violence. Um, uh, but uh, as a female journalist, I, I got it. So um, uh, while there is a lot of gender-based uh, 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 discrimination in Ukraine, I would also argue that uh, um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, human rights problems with uh, which both uh, women, uh, female and male journalists and activists uh, suffer from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have been told that um, Larissa will not be able to be here today, nor uh, so we're going to go right to Irina. First of all, let me thank the organizers for giving the space for discussion. Uh, also, thank all the panelists for their great stories and courage, and to all of you to uh, listen to us. Uh, so. Um, and I was given seven, seven minutes, and I think it's too short to uh, discuss all the complexity of this uh, topic that we are discussing today, but um, let me try. <laughs> Sorry, eight. Um, eight minutes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm speaking here on, um, a, as a private individual, as Ukrainian, and not representing any organization. Um, I have a confession to make. Uh, I'm not a journalist, but I believe we have the same goals. Um, I believe we know the power of information and we all want to save the world. Uh, with that motivation in mind, in 2014, I joined the uh, Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. Um, it's a, basically a media platform. Um, and um, I quit back then my comfortable job um, at the private sector. And um, at the Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, we hosted um, hundreds of experts and media from around the world and uh, they were covering uh, events in Maidan, in Crimea, and developments in Eastern Ukraine. So um, basically, the, the media center back then played this crucial role. Um, it basically gave Ukraine a voice. Um, later, in 2014, I joined the OSCE uh, Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine that was back then just deployed um, to, yeah, to Ukraine. And um, I found, shortly I found myself uh, in a bulletproof vest, um, in, surrounded by armed men and uh, crying uh, people. Uh, at the same time, I felt that um, informational war was as damaging as um, the real one. And um, I had no other wish than just joining the fight for truth. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and um, um, then I realized that uh, I have to do what I can where I am with what, uh, with what I have, and my motivation uh, just soared. Uh, working for the reputable organization with the biggest presence on both sides of the contact line um, was the best opportunity uh, back then. Um, because the spe special monitoring mission uh, collects facts uh, using uh, unarmed uh, aerial vehicles, um, satellite imagery, and um, cameras, and of course humans, which is the best source. <laughs> uh, it was they they were patrolling um, every day, um, and I want to play this short video if I can. <coughs> Make less light, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe less light. It says enter the, the password. Yes, but it's sound. We can't hear you, Beth. 
Okay. All right, I will try to speak louder. Please turn the lights on. Can somebody help me? Um, Uh -huh. what, for those who didn't hear, what Irina is about to do is show a video of um, uh, of um, how uh, information okay. recon, because there's a okay. disinformation war going on right now about what is actually happening in the war zone in uh, eastern Ukraine. There actually are uh, uh, mechanisms where facts are gathered, both through aerial uh, reconnaissance, uh, human intelligence, uh, a movement of armed equipment to make sure that the actual what's going on on the ground is collected <coughs> as, uh, to fight against the disinformation. This is being funded. Um, my understanding is. Is it the line? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, excellent. It is, it, yes, it, it, it gets posted online as well. Also, while we're doing that, for those who came in later and did not pick up. It's not connected. Um, bios and uh, uh, of the speakers. Um, Marina up here can give them to you. Please just raise your hand and she'll bring it to you. <coughs> so I will play you the video a little bit later. <laughs> So basically my work was to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, SMM, uh, which is this mission where I worked, uh, is uh, treated as an eyes and ears by media and by international community. Um, I had this unique position to be able to work on the both sides of the contact line since the very beginning of the conflict. Uh, so um, I was able to observe how um, information or uh, better called um, disinformation um, manipulated the minds of Ukrainians. Um, it also created um, the gap, um, fueled hate, and a wish to destroy them on the other side. Wait. Okay, and I think the video... <coughs> Um, so the Organization for Security and Cooperation is um, OSCE. OSCE, yes. Okay. Uh, it's uh, basically 57 participating states, and each of the states okay. does donations. So, for those who are familiar with the OSCE, um, it is an international organization, the Organization for the Security and Cooperation in Europe, and OSCE actually, with the 57 countries, put in a budget funded this fact-finding mission and uh, which yeah, it's, um, soon the video. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the video might not be played. <laughs> oh, it may not be? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I will just continue because I'll okay. video for now. Maybe there will be no video. <laughs> okay. There might be. <laughs> it's unfortunate because it's uh, it's such a complex, complex mission. It's been deployed since 2014. And since then, it goes and reports every day and um, collects facts on the ground and does the reporting. Reports become public, so it's accessible for everyone. And the reports are based only on factual information, uh, the information that is verified. Um, so um, because, again, these reports are factual, it, it was used uh, as the great source for fighting propaganda and misinformation. Um, for example, we used reports for um, fact-checking with us, we did published um, reports online and highlighted what was wrong in the, in the media, what was uh, actually disinformation out there and trying to tackle it. And also, um, the, with the help with the, of the mission, we um, provide access to information. Um, we invited national and international media to join patrols uh, to the areas where they it was difficult to get to, so they would provide the coverage. Um, and you can find online the coverage from CNN, BBC, uh, Deutsche Welle, Inter, OnePlus One, you name it. Um, 
for those who uh, could not join, we did streaming online, we did Facebook uh, lives, and to, in order to provide equal opportunities for um, all media. And uh, we always never said no to interviews. Uh, we also um, organized many regular press briefings uh, inside, um, in Ukraine and outside Ukraine. Um, I believe uh, all of this uh, was important not only uh, to bring facts on the table, but also to cover human stories, feelings, um, and emotions. Um, at times, work was not easy. Um, and I will try to explain why, uh, because some of these facts turn out to be an uncomfortable truth for one or the other side. And this is when monitors who were putting all their heart in what they're doing uh, were called spies. Um, also, monitors were called um, blind, because in reality they are unbiased. They could not draw conclusions, point fingers, or, or draw information that is not uh, based uh, on facts. Um, also, monitors are unarmed, so they cannot stop fighting. And this is why at times they were called uh, useless, which is in reality a different thing because the mandate of uh, the mission is to monitor and report on facts and also facilitate dialogue. And uh, um, also, they are eye, arms, um, eyes and ears, but they are not arms, uh, because the special monitor mission has no humanitarian mandate. Um, and that was probably one of the most painful parts for me, working there, um, because, for example, when you arrive at a spot um, and see this half-damaged house uh, that was just hit by a mine, you're meeting the owner of the house, are you learning that his wife is in the hospital? Um, and then it was very difficult to explain that you're there just to collect facts and not really help to, to not really help with this disaster that people were just facing. Um, saying this, um, at the same time, a uh, special monitoring mission facilitated over a thousand, um, uh, thousand times the access of humanitarian aid delivery to the different locations, including those that um, my colleague just previously um, showed. Uh, also, um, they facilitated. Yes, that's good. Also, they um, facilitated the um, ceasefire in order for repair crews to come and fix the most important infrastructure. And this was happening at the times when people uh, stayed without uh, power and running water for weeks and when it was <coughs> minus 20 degrees Celsius outside. Um, so what I'm trying to say is um, that there is a mandate of a human uh, that is along with the non-humanitarian SMM mandate. And there is so much work has been done behind the scenes that normally people would not be able um, yeah, to see. Um, these people, and I wish I were able to show something <laughs> about them, <laughs> they, were wearing, uh, they are wearing white helmets and blue jackets. Um, so these people not only collect facts, but uh, they also defend human rights. And I'm proud I was one of them. Um, for me personally, uh, there is no better thing than to um, hug a lady who is now in safe Mariupol. Um, uh, for those who don't know, this is a very close um, city uh, to the contact line. Um, so to hug a lady who is in safe Mariupol, um, uh, whom I tried personally to convince to flee her um, unsafe uh, house at the contact line uh, and stay alive. Um, or, for instance, to create uh, and share a thousand of um, mine awareness leaflets uh, to save the life of at least one kid um, when I saw the death of the other. Mm, or, for example, being able to look in the eyes um, of an armed person who doesn't let you access um, the crash site of MH17 um, where 298 victims are and ask him a question why. I have so many stories like this to tell and I wish I were able to show something 
but um, I think we'll my time it, is yeah, over. Yeah, we'll give it one more minute. Hopefully, I don't know how that is going on the chance. Um, yeah, so I have many more stories like this to tell. Please ask me if you're interested. <laughs> and what I want to say is each of the story is worth living for. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, um, hopefully when we get into the Q&A section, there might be a chance to, the video will be up and running. Um, what we hope to show you is, um, because Irina was part of the fact-finding mission from the OSCE, they, uh, as we know here also in America, for those of you here who now live in America, disinformation has become a political tool, not only in uh, the hybrid war that's going on between Ukraine and Russia, but it's really become a political tool. I won't say we have a hybrid war going on in the United States, but disinformation is um, uh, destructive because it misleads people and it leads to dangerous situations. And in, in case of Ukraine, it actually leads to death. So uh, it's important to do these missions to, so that people have the correct information so they can make good decisions. As Irina just said, she was trying to convince a woman from Mariupol that really, I'm not kidding you, based on the facts that we have, you need to leave your home now, otherwise you will die. And these are the kinds of decisions that have to be made daily for the last four years in eastern Ukraine. Um, is this working now, or what do you think? It is. Sir? Yes, ma'am. You are our expert. Are we good to go? We're good to, to go, yeah. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> sort of. Yes. <laughs> Should I play? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and is there sound? There are subtitles. There are subtitles. All right. Seven hundred monitors for the countries. Досягнувши взаєморозуміння, наблизити мир. Факти мають значення. Спеціальна моніторингова місія ОБСЄ. And that's actually the lady that we were trying to convince to flee her house. And you can see the condition of her house. Um, yeah, she had a sister. Uh, and they both stayed in this house until the very end. Because uh, as she told me, how can I flee the house if I survived the World War II here? So I will survive this one as well. And that's just when we actually greeted her in Mariupol, when her and her sister finally um, made this decision to flee. And actually, anytime I'm visiting Mariupol, I'm still visiting these two old ladies. And these are the leaflets that I initiated. Uh, we distributed them uh, everywhere uh, in the, on the both sides of the contact line, in schools, in hospitals, <coughs> in basically any location where there was an access or opportunity to share it with kids. Uh, because as I also mentioned, uh, we there was a story behind it. So we had uh, two little brothers in the village where, that we, pat we were patrolling um, on a daily basis. And uh, after a month, when I came back, I learned that actually two of them are not uh, alive any longer because they played with the unexploded ordinance. And that's the um, crash site of MH17. 
and that was the rebel who didn't allow us to proceed and start to collect facts on the ground and actually open up this um, area for um, area and bring the information to, to the world. It's just a couple of facts on how many uh, daily reports are compiled on an everyday basis and how many patrols are conducted, um, ceasefire violations that we observed during 2017. And you can see the dramatic numbers. We can also see how many um, heavy weapons observed and, uh, and the rest of information. Here is the mirror patrols. So it's basically the patrols that help to, um, that are located on the both sides of the contact line and help to um, keep the ceasefire. Uh, for repair crews to, to to actually do their job. And these reports, in case you're interested, they are available online and they are updated every uh, two weeks. And it has a little piece of fact matters, which is has, has succinct information of what is happening on the ground and um, other information on, on the mission. Thank you again. I'm really sorry for the technical issues I had. Um, we got information to that we do have actually the word from Larissa, so uh, Martha Kibalo is going to read it quickly, and then we're going to move on to Crimea. Our panelist was to be Larissa Artyugina, and she is a reporter, she is a journalist, a documentary filmmaker, but she's also a volunteer in a non-governmental organizational project, and we don't have her video, but we do have a short statement from her about her non-governmental organization called New Donbass. New Donbass was registered in February of 2015, and it took as its mission to create dialogue between Ukraine's east and west because of the disinformation, there are tensions, and also uh, they uh, wanted to have access to the areas that were under Russian control, now under Ukrainian government control, to help those people recoup and to show goodwill from the side of um, the rest of Ukraine, from central Ukraine, western Ukraine, uh, to extend a hand into eastern Ukrainian territories that have been traumatized. So she says, our volunteer groups go into war traumatized communities to try to create common ground in these somewhat strained relations. Of course, demonstration of goodwill does not start with words alone. <coughs> when dealing with people who've been traumatized, one has to help that person find some stability first to make sure that they have a safe place to live. It means first bringing them building supplies, linoleum for the floors, plaster for the walls, replacement windows for those that have been shot out. That helps soothe the trauma for them, and only then does their fear start to subside. When our volunteer team first enters a community, we have contact often with the children first, and they go back home and say to their parents, some good people from Kiev have come to help us. And even if the parents say, no, they're bad people, uh, they say, no, Dad, you do not understand. Today we did this and this, and we feel that these are, this is a good thing. So trust, she says, is the main thing, more important than anything else. The volunteers do not start with ideological or political views. First, they have some fun together, uh, sing and dance, and then they get to work on some sort of construction project, fixing a house that has been damaged, and then talk some more, and then go back to work again. Painting is good, she says, painting houses, but also painting pictures. And they bring easels, they bring paintbrushes, uh, lots of colors to work with, and this releases psychological trauma. So um, she says, we do all the work together. And they often bring celebrities in. At one point, they brought a star from Kiev, uh, Rima Zubina, was among the volunteers. And when the people of the community saw her on her knees uh, scrubbing a floor, they were very impressed. Um, that she said, this is very important, that the volunteers roll up their sleeves and get down to hard work. Um, uh, she says, our new Donbass organization also thinks it's very important to take time to live with the people in the communities uh, so that you don't come help for a short time and then leave, just to get to know people well. Not a, not a quick fix sort of a job. 
our groups of volunteers come in with technical assistance, but it really is their physical presence in the community that makes a difference. Uh, she describes a scene where a young man, Alex, was among the volunteers. He's someone who came in from London to join the volunteer group from New Donbass. And the first thing the kids did was take selfies with him and put them up on Facebook. And look, we have a visitor from London among us. It's important, she says, that, the youth, that the, there is a youth component to the volunteer groups also. The youth share a language of their own and they have a very quick communication platform that, that gets set up between them. So she says, when they send a volunteer group, for the first week the goal is to build a foundation of trust. After that first week, they leave. There's a pause to give the people of the community a chance to talk among themselves about what they're experiencing and how they feel about you being there. People need time to allow for this kind of acceptance to build. So visit number one is getting introduced and building trust. Visit number two for them, she says, is working together. Uh, at the at, uh, at the second time, people are ready to start working together to start to rebuild a house and it, or, uh, or infra other infrastructure and imagine how their lives can, uh, can evolve from here. There's happiness in working together. She says working physically, digging a garden bed, gathering up the garbage, all of that. She, uh, she paints this picture that she put signs up in the village that, it, that on this day we would meet and it would be a cleanup day in the territory of the village. It says at first nobody showed up, but all the volunteer group got out there and started cleaning up the schoolyard. And within an hour, uh, 20 adults and lots of children had joined them and everyone was working together suddenly, talking together and making plans to have tea or share meals together afterwards. So after this kind of working experience, she says then again a pause and they plan to come a third time. Um, when they come the third time, she said it really doesn't matter very much what they do, but one thing that they do try to do is come around a holiday of sorts. If it's in the winter time, St. Nicholas Day might be a day that they would choose to celebrate together with the, vil with the people in the area, in the local community. And she says, make a pageant of it, just do it as people like um, costumes, be creative, do it in a way that, that people feel happy. Again, a pause, and she says the fourth time they come in, it's really all about communication on a, some, on a deeper level. Their vehicle is cultural and educational programs, so uh, she says in her statement that they bring professional actors, stage directors, musicians, so that they have something to entertain with, and also to give coaching to, because people are good singers and good actors, and they have a professional coaching them, and they put on some sort of stage presentation that they can uh, see their skills um, raised to some better expertise level, and they, they share their uh, deeper selves through this vehicle. So building trust, working together, celebrating, uh, communicating, and the last one, she said, the last kinds of visits are to extend the project into a really continuous relationship. Uh, they, they wanted to leave something very permanent behind because there was a platform of mutual trust and friendship that they had built. Um, in one case, they found someone who was an unemployed teacher of art who said that she would devote her time for the next period of her life, phase of her life, in the village to keep running an art program that they had initiated. And she lived among, and they kept the visits going back and forth. Um, they say now on a personal level, we're now friends, we feel responsible for one another. It's no longer a one-sided outreach, but cooperation and mutual friendship. Uh, the volunteering and it ends up changing. Both the volunteers are changed themselves fundamentally and also the community. So this is a, a perspective from an NGO in Ukraine that is working towards this kind of people-to-people -people outreach and, and encouraging um, exchanges of ideas and dialoguing. Um, there are people here in the audience who I know have experienced um, similar things and they, they can do the question and answer. But, that's the statement. Thank you. We have uh, focused on uh, Eastern Ukraine.
right now. Again, for the people who came in later, uh, there are two areas of conflict in Ukraine right now, initiated four years ago with uh, Russia's hybrid war, and that is the occupation of Donbass, or eastern Ukraine, and the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, they are related. We're not going to go into the whole geopolitical uh, explanation again. Uh, they've been condemned internationally, and it was a, a unprovoked, pointless land grab that has had uh, huge consequences uh, in terms of human health, uh, displaced persons, economic, uh, basically destruction, uh, children's health, education, usually what everything that accompanies war. However, there's also a specific thing we want to focus on, and that is the plight of the uh, indigenous people of the Crimea Peninsula, uh, Crimean Tatars, and um, who have been, again, displaced twice in two generations, really, three generations. They were um, under the Soviet system. They were run off the peninsula and said uh, uh, by the Soviet government at the time, by Moscow, and now they're again, were displaced uh, by, again, Moscow, but this time under the government of the Russian Federation. Uh, Crimea is um, extremely strategic for many reasons. It is uh, on the Black Sea, it has oil reserves, it's got gas reserves, it's got ports, uh, it is militarily important, it is a bridge between NATO and um, uh, the former Soviet Union or the Russian Federation. So strategically, Russia wants it for many reasons, comes up with lots of excuses why it belongs to Russia and only Russia, uh, most of which have been debunked. We're not going to get into that as well. But the biggest consequence is the displacement and again destruction of the lives of the Crimean Tatars. We have Ayla Bakali here, who is the uh, representative of the Mejlis um, in the United States to speak with us. So we're going to, while we're staying with Ukraine, we're now going to switch to Crimea. Ayla, please. Yeah, but yes, I will just make a few remarks. This is the short film that uh, that just came in this morning, Martha. Okay, so um, thank you so you very much. Oh yes, let me go to the microphone. You are correct. I, I can jump over. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Irina, uh, very very much, and I. Uh, particularly, um, I came in a little bit uh, late after you started, but I did uh, uh, absorb immediately Alisa's uh, comments and Irna's as well, and they are so much similar to the Crimean Tatar journalist's position. Um, Alisa, you are correct. Um, there is gender-free <laughs> a journalist at this time in uh, the occupation and conflict of, uh, in Ukraine is gender free. As long as you're an ac activist, as long as you are uh, espousing the territorial integrity of your homeland, uh, you are immediately targeted. It, that's very, very uh, correct. And uh, just briefly, uh, with a specific focus on the Crimean Tatars, I would like to say that um, the journalists, Crimean Tatar journalists, are uh, civic activists, slash activists, slash indigenous people, slash uh, Ukrainian citizens. So um, currently, the Crimean Tatar journalists are the only ones that constitute the most reliable and regular source of objective information from uh, <laughs> Crimea and also the human rights uh, violations. Um, the film that I just want to show, uh, that's one minute, is by a uh, Crimean Tatar journalist who uh, came from Crimea several days ago. And we wanted to have her video Skype with us in the room, but she specifically requested that not to have her face or her name appear. And that's why she's not on the distributes, but I do want to share with you in the room, she is a, a <coughs> broadcast journalist, her name, uh, and she has her own time slot in the first Crimean Tatar television that's registered under Ukrainian FCC, if you will, the broadcasting stations. 
and um, and I hope to have her uh, come during the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which is in the week of April 16th. And I would love to introduce to everyone all the uh, Ukrainians here that will be here on, Mar on April 16th. And, and I would also want to say that um, uh, there is no independent media in Crimea. And, and the critical role of both Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainian human rights defenders and Crimean Tatars, because it's hard for me to separate when both are doing the same thing. And, and they are really at hand to counter the fake news that Russia so-called is successful at. They really uh, sour the image that, in fact, the referendum that took place on March 16, 2014, that it was unanimous. The importance of especially women journalists is that they do capture a more detailed, nuanced situation on the ground. They focus on personalities, they uh, focus on also the spiritual influences, they uh, have a much more keener perspective on the bias that's out there. So I think, um, um, yes, you are correct. Crimea is definitely under occupation, illegally annexed. It is a black hole uh, for the news media. Uh, yesterday, uh, Martha and I and uh, Myrna were at the uh, UN uh, Security Council session, and it, it, it was surreal when you have the UN Security Council members um, who have in addition to the UN member states with a 100 vote, um, voted confirming Ukraine's territorial integrity, that you have someone there yesterday saying, what kind of reality do you have? Uh, and so what the uh, journalist, Alyssa, that I really captured your words that I put at the end, it's really, not only facts, but it's a mind game. And, and through the revelation of facts, um, the journalists, with the, the women journalists in particular, capturing the nuances, are able to um, uh, shed a sunlight on the mind games that's out there. So there is a mind game component that Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar journalists are tackling. So um, with that, I don't want to take up uh, too much of uh, the time speaking. Uh, there's two films here. One is for 10 minutes, and the next one is close to five minutes, mm -hmm. I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Five yes. minutes. And she said to me this morning, and we were working on it, let's do the five minutes. And upon request, we can do the 10 minutes. Let's if do you the want. five. Uh, we have the ability to go to 10 10 here in this room. Yes. Or some of you want to go to other sessions. So let's do the five minutes. Go to do some QA. I agree with you. Yes. And then if we have time, we'll so go to So this way, the next we'll one. get the whole story. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. I'm just going to skip right over you. Light? Light. We can have lights Please. in the back. Light? Yeah.
the Crimean Tatars have always been for the Russian authorities as an eyesore. Russia seeks to destroy the Crimean Tatars physically and mentally. It has created the myth about the indigenous Russian Crimea. Bullying of the Crimean journalist itself there as well, so we'll just move it fast forward. It's okay, it's all okay. It's okay. Uh, the first one that I sent you. Yes, yes. I would like to thank organizers of the site event at the 62nd session of the CCW Women's Conference at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. While I would like to have been with all of you, but our busy schedule here in Kiev has kept us here. This year will mark she the fourth year it. of the illegal and temporary occupation of Crimea by the Russian Federation. <coughs> Since the seizure of the Crimea by the Russian Federation military, the consequences of annexation were evident in all aspects of life of the annexed peninsula and especially for indigenous Crimean Tatar women. As, as the Russian authorities implemented systematic searches, interrogation, detention, arrest and abduction of remaining residents, this not only had an effect on the Crimean Tatar men that they arrest but also to their families. The young men that they arrest are the sole providers for their families and exempted families as well, given that most of the Crimean Tatar women are stay home mothers, this has left them vulnerable and needing economic and social support. They have exacted political pressure on the indigenous population. Crimean Tatars have been under this pressure for four years. 952 citizens have been illegally detained including 649 indigenous Crimean Tatars. 53 people are political prisoners of the Crimea, 28 of which are Crimean Tatars. And included in the group was our veteran Crimean Tatar woman activist, 82 year old activist Vijay Kashkov, who was with other Several of activists was detained but occupied Russian and died as uh, she was taken away by an ambulance. Ukraine Foreign Minister Pavel Klinkin posted on Twitter that Kashka was a heroic and courageous woman and that her death was another tragedy for the pressure that Russian exerts in Crimea. I would like to tell you who is a legendary indigenous Crimean Tatar woman. Vidya Kashka, she is a veteran of the national movement. Vidya Kashka was born in Crimea in 1934 in the village of Uskut, now Privetna, between Alushta and Sudak. Like the entire Crimean Tatar people, she was deported in 1944 to the Central Asia at the age of 10. Even during exile, Vijay Kashka led an active lifestyle. She was involved with the origins of the Crimean Tatar national movement. Unlimited life for her native land, she was a catalyst for the Kashka family. She was the man of the house. 
before the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1960, Lydia Hanouzis, her four young children, was one of the first Crimean Tatars to attempt to return to the Crimea, but Soviet Russian deported her family again. Reason because she was an indigenous Crimean Tatar. She didn't give up as soon as Ukrainian uh, gained in the independence uh, from Soviet Russia in 1991. She went to settle in Crimea. She was also a companion of the dissident political and public figure on all the leaders of Crimea Tatar uh, people, Mustafa Dimitri. But her struggle didn't end. Then came the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. She won against Soviet Russian, but now she was ready to with our Russian Federation. She was 78 years old this time. Lydia wasn't going to cry. She committed herself to the struggle again. Her house became a meeting place for Crimean Tatar activities. She, at the age of 82, was not going to stand by, by and uh, watch passively the aggression of the Russian authorities against her compatriots. She was fearless. Despite her privilege, she constantly visited court uh, hearings where illegal sentences were <coughs> pronounced against Crimean Tatars. She was sit fast in her principle. I never stood aside when I saw injustice. On November 23, 2017, during the so-called operation of Russian Sovereignty to detain Crimean Tatar activists, Lydia Kashka was a witness as bystander voicing the injustice of this act. Along with her compatriots, she was being arrested and as Russian authorities took her, she died in the ambulance. The memory of the Crimean Tatars as a symbol of the struggle to return to their native land and the rights of compatriots. In March 2014, representatives of the so-called Crimean cell defendants Pat and ordinary citizen Crimean Tatars Richard Ahmedov who left a single peak on the Lenin Square in Simferopol. A few days later his uh, mutilated body was found on the Belogosk district. As a journalist for eight years I witnessed uh, initial stages leading up to the seizure of Crimea by the Russian military for the indigenous Crimean Tatars the reader of anything in place of compact residence of the Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars okay. land stood uh, we, on uh, my we have to okay. okay, excellent, excellent, yes, very do. good, okay. very good. I just wanted yeah. the legendary Crimean Tatar women to be shared with all of you. That was the key part of it. Thank, thank you, you very much. That's thank why you. I stopped thank it. You. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that is an example of a woman human rights mm -hmm. defender, as um, Martha said at the very beginning, whether in 1998 the UN passed um, uh, the, the human um, the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders, which is journalists, civic activists, uh, religious leaders, uh, law enforcement have the right, they're protected when they are carrying out their duties or doing their actions not only as individuals, but in their capacity as a professional to report human rights abuses, protect human rights abuses, inform about human rights abuses. And this was an example of, of a woman who did it pretty much her entire life. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, just to be clear, uh, uh, those who want to go to sessions that begin, I think, at 10 or 10 15, uh, can, you know, you have just a few minutes. This room, we are going to go for another 10, 12 minutes. So we're going to, because there's nothing happening in this room immediately afterwards. So we said, we, they told us we could have the space. So, but I think now would be a good time to start going into questions uh, to, for that time. Um, if, as the moderator, if you will allow me, I'm going to ask some of the first questions uh, to each of our panelists. Um, in, to Tamara, I mean, and we can order, I think, 
one of the things going way back to the beginning, which seems like just, you know, at this point, we get this such an information intense morning. Um, one of the comments that you made is that there is in, uh, and I confirm this, uh, ha, uh, uh, working from uh, another perspective, that the word gender, for some reason, it provokes huge terror in, in major parts, and I'm going to say primarily m male populations, whether it's political <coughs> leaders or clergy, uh, <clears throat> and there's a lot of confusion where there seems to be not a separation between the personal lives, for example. I mean, of course, you know, you as a husband and wife are allowed to have any kind of relationship you want. She can be your most loving and beautiful wife, and he can be your most strong and wonderful husband, but that does not necessarily automatically have to and should be translated into the public sphere. There's some kind of fear about the word gender and the um, relationships of expectations that seem to be prevalent. So I'd like if you could maybe address that um, and the objectification of women that continues and how that affects. Um, the flip side is from both of you, we heard, um, and from Isla as well, that when it comes to reporting about the war situation in Crimea or in Eastern Ukraine and the Donbass, gender no longer matters. I mean, if you're a journalist, if you're an information expert, if you're an activist, it doesn't matter if you're a man. You may feel personally more vulnerable, but you're equally an enemy. It's not as though there's any kind of big consideration given to you that you are a woman and therefore we're gonna be nicer to you. It's sort of, no, it's equal opportunity uh, sort of. Um, so if, if you could speak to, to that and how much of that do you think is actually inspired by um, uh, in Ukraine, uh, citizens of Ukraine, uh, sort of um, individuals, and how much of that is part of a planned public disinformation campaign, a trolling that is actually paid for out of, out of uh, Russia, and when it comes to that. Um, and I also would like for you, uh, Elisa, if you could address, why do you think, or both of you actually, why is it that in fact more women are covering, uh, and also um, Isla uh, with uh, women in uh, Crimea, covering these wars. Um, because that is exactly what happened during 1901's declaration of Ukrainian independence. When the Soviet Union began to fall apart and journalists came in from the West, the vast majority of them were women to cover those events. I'm just curious, not that there may necessarily be a parallel, but what you think are the reasons um, for that. So if we could do that first, and then we'll take some uh, questions from the audience, that would be great. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, thanks a lot. Uh, you're absolutely right. There is a misunderstanding and not understanding what uh, gender and uh, inequality and women's rights in general in Ukraine. <coughs> and I believe that one of the reasons it's a uh, lack of human rights education in schools. It's quite new subjects and I think it's only recently that we, uh, that it started uh, at schools and the role of media is very important. Ukrainians, they watch TV a lot and when you see on major roles that are promoted for women and men, they are not absolutely realistic because uh, Ukrainian women are very well educated and actively involved in labor market. But still, when you see from those TV shows what role I expected, it's to be, you know, to be, to be beautiful uh, object, to, to uh, marry successfully, whatever. So I think that uh, this uh, education and media are major factor that influence. Uh, and uh, what I could see as a person who are uh, making interviews with, uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, especially women human rights activists that in general women who are doing a lot they by themselves may <coughs> underestimate their role and they are perceived very often you know on the backstage uh, and we could see that uh, it was constantly in the history of uh, women's movement uh, in Ukraine and in other countries uh, not always uh, the role of uh, women in activism is equally valued as role uh, as role of men. And a number of women who are invited to participate in my 
project on women for human rights activists. They believe that they are not, I don't know, uh, like uh, that they, their efforts or their role are not significant enough to be part to be part of this. And some are fight for the really, I would say, uh, I think it's bad, so it works bad. And some are really like, uh, as a sociologist, we did a grassroots project in Visible Battalion, where we um, uh, researched women who are participating in, as a military in, uh, in combat in front lines. And actually, they are not recognized uh, uh, by uh, they were not recognized by state. But uh, it's, uh, it's great that uh, actually that situation is changing because it's important when women as a group they try to pay attention to this, and uh, as they try to demonstrate, they organize different initiatives and they criticize uh, beauty contests or. or, or instead of professionalism, because of course uh, it could be one of the role, but the problem is when the, well, we don't have choice and when there is clear notion of what should be valued in the society. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. that is. So the question was on... Uh, <coughs> one, one of the questions, was, it was kind of a, um, was, a, one, why do you believe that there are more women than men covering in uh, uh, the areas in Donbass and in Crimea? That um, uh, would be one. And the second one is the disinformation. How much of when you said that you, for example, got this um, tweet or text uh, that said, you know, all of uh, you should be hung, is this in fact uh, emotional reactions from the citizens of Ukraine that are being set up against one another, or do you think this is part of a professional trolling operation that is uh, part of the disinformation war? Okay, speaking of women, uh, first of all, I think there are a lot of women in Ukrainian journalism in general. Louder. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, So first of all, I think there are a lot of uh, women in Ukrainian journalism in general. At least if you look at the uh, departments of journalism in universities. Um, as far as I remember, in Donetsk uh, National University, there were like 99% students who were journalists. So there are gen generally many journalists in Ukrainian journalism. Second, as I said uh, during my talk, um, uh, for the uh, uh, conflict coverage, uh, I believe, uh, especially in the beginning, it was a lot uh, an issue of uh, safety. Because as a woman, again, uh, I believe I pretty much exploited gender stereotypes in this case. But as a woman, you have more chances to sneak in and to sneak out. And uh, as uh, our colleague from OEC mentioned, when you look in the eyes of that man in Balaklava who doesn't let you in, as a woman, you you feel safer, me at least. Yeah, I had uh, I had situations when uh, um, uh, militaries, especially on DPR side, they were very suspicious of my male colleagues. They were like, look, I see how he walks, I see how he holds himself, he's military, I know he's spy. But as a woman, they look at you, they don't really, they don't see you as a threat. They don't really expect anything bad from you. So which uh, uh, is probably not very good from gender point of view, but it, uh, it helps a lot. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, um, trolling and uh, all this kind of stuff, uh, first of all, I would like to note, we were talking a lot about Russian disinformation and uh, Russian aggression in, the, in this informational war, which is completely correct. But I would like to know that there is a lot of that on the Ukrainian side as well. And unfortunately, Ukrainian journalists, I feel they were very, they felt very intimidated by this uh, action from Russian side. Uh, and what they chose to react was to, let's do the same. Let's actually fight this informational war on our side. So what I received, it was definitely from Ukrainian side. And uh, there is a lot of, um, there is a, a lot of degree of this professional trolling. But also I believe there are a lot of, uh, let's say, useful idiots who, just eat and they do the same and they, and they think this is uh, something good to do to intimidate people who disagree with you. There is a lot of that in uh, Ukraine now on both sides and in the both political camps of uh, um, not accepting uh, the different opinion and different point of view and automatically labeling people as enemy, terrorist, traitor, whatever, if you have a different opinion. Um, I just 
wanted to say uh, to your uh, comment that uh, for Crimean Tatar women journalists um, in particular, um, the women are increasingly during times of conflict always take on roles that they would not have taken on traditionally. So with respect to Crimean Tatar women, for example, there are over a hundred men who are imprisoned, wrongfully imprisoned in, in the occupied Crimea. So now you have women who have become the heads of households with children that they need to fend for themselves. So they are now also um, uh, finding ways to um, explain the situation, their circumstance, etc. But I think um, uh, during times of conflict, uh, women have always have had interests and always are, um, are uh, concerned about the society and the events that are surrounding them. So in that respect, as indigenous Crimean Tatars, it's difficult to stand by and watch your uh, people uh, suffer and, and the great injustice, as the journalist has said, you know, truth is I am, uh, I am here, I gave up my career for the truth. You had so mentioned and I thought they were uh, quite very uh, uh, words of wisdom from someone such as, as uh, yourself, very young and starting new and facing so many conflicts. So I think um, I am not a journalist, I'm a historian, uh, but uh, uh, definitely um, with respect to Crimean Tatars, the fact that she's not able to be here is a testament uh, to their restrictions, but uh, for every hole there is that they can wiggle out of, they wiggle out of to give the news. So that's, uh, I can say that much. I I just wanted to add to Isla's, uh, we heard her speak uh, last week, um, and she had, there's a bridge being built that Russia decided to build between Russia and Crimea to Kerch. bypass the, the, Kerch, Kerch. Yeah, the Kerch Pass, and to bypass um, Ukraine and uh, supplies, getting supplies from Ukraine. Um, and as Isla said, well, everybody thinks that that bridge um, is so that the Russians can come more into Crimea. We always say they're building a bridge for themselves to get out of Crimea. <laughs> faster. So, <laughs> faster and quicker, so. All right, Irena, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to ag agree totally <laughs> with, uh, with my other colleague. Uh, so um, being um, a woman and working for these organizations for security and cooperation and being there in the conflict, it actually was at times um, beneficial, probably, because first of all, you can easily uh, connect with civilians, especially women. You can ask them more questions, probably, naturally, yeah, than men. You can ask not only about security situation and, and military, whatever, and you can also ask how do they feel, did their kids uh, ate today, or um, how, how is it going with running water, or how is it cold or warm. So basically, you are just able to get Mm, more information, uh, which is so much needed to be covered, also, um, except of security radiation. Um, then, uh, probably, um, with regards to the second uh, question on trolling, um, I have seen lots of this information, and I'm very passionate about this topic. I think I can do another presentation just on that, and uh, to explain how is it coming around, about, and uh, bring examples. Um, I can say that there is so much of this and uh, it's very difficult to tackle it, especially uh, with like little, little machine. Um, it's um, quite uh, also poisoning, yeah, is if there is one disinformation out, you have to create hundreds of positive messages or right messages to tackle that previous um, piece of information. Um, and uh, I've seen uh, this happening throughout the conflict. So first, when uh, first demonstration started in um, in Kharkiv and in Donetsk, when uh, when these areas um, were still, um, I mean, Donetsk was still under government control, um, you can see uh, at these demonstrations people were holding um, posters, and basically posters, uh, you can see three main uh, key messages, yeah, throughout all the posters. So basically, you know that these posters were. Uh, or these messages were seeded in people's heads so that they come out 
already with this information that they took from somewhere. Uh, but you can see the pattern throughout. So, um, the, and, and, and another example, uh, quite a drastic one, uh, is uh, I've observed not once uh, how uh, a group of, um, I call them actors, yeah? Um, so the group of people uh, who were specially brought to a location where is they know that there will be high visibility um, and there will be lots of media, etc. and they would play. They would um, create a distress, they would uh, at times even physically try to, 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 to push you just to uh, compromise uh, some information and just to create this uh, wrong, uh, wrong perception. Then of course it's all filmed and of course it's all out there and it looks very real and somebody who is taking and looking and what um, getting this information from uh, TV, uh, just eating it like this without even questioning. And that's the uh, saddest part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much.